so we uh, came up with a plan to go after the boat. We talked about the best way to get around and and uh, approach the boat. Ligon went and talked to whomever, to to I don't know if it was to, to the command or Captain Williams or the sheriff. We have a, a, a what we believe is a last known loca location under a John boat. Um, so I know that that is happening, and I, and I do remember the radio traffic about um, a call had come in in the area about a, somebody uh, either uh, walking in the yard or in the middle of the road that may be armed. And Indicating that she thought she saw something with night vision goggles uh, to the rear of her residence. And I walk up to the sheriff, and the sheriff didn't even say a word. He just said, come on. And we go back and get into his truck. Uh, I had um, Trent Ferris uh, in my truck um, to the right of me in the passenger seat and Joey Wallace in the uh, rear passenger seat. And I'm on the phone with um, Lieutenant Fred Moore, uh, who was at the original scene. And I'm getting some intel from him and some information from him about the domestic violence aspect of it. And we're just trying to game plan on how to tell people. They had already sent out a reverse 911 to the area about the guy and what was going on, uh, but we needed to get a message out to the, the news. I saw the ambulance actually pulled up right there where we were at, and they had, um, I didn't know at the time, but they had Cole Green in the back, and they were working with Cole. And we were sitting there, Mike Ligon had come up to the car, and we were talking to him about getting just a quick rundown of what happened with him and Randy in the woods and the next thing he said is like sheriff we got to go we got to go clear that boat all right we're gonna go ahead and go clear this boat so put that plan to action uh, we received a call about somebody walking down a power line with night vision goggles so we sent the helicopter to check it out people say you know why don't you guys wait well you can't wait you can't let him be out there. Um, he's already shot at four police officers, hit one. I didn't know how bad he was and how bad Randy was. Um, if you're willing to shoot at four cops and then go on the rampage and you're, you have provisions, you start getting desperate. There's a lot of good people that live over there. You got a lot of great people that live in this county. Um, we didn't want him to hurt any of them, take them hostage, maybe kill them. And we finally decided that, hey, you know, we're going to pull up in the driveway. We'll send one team, you know, we'll send the fourth man team to the right, which was going to consist of me, him, um, Grady Gonzalez, and Judd Baird. And then the three man team would go to the left side of the residence, which was going to be Buddy, Kyle, and Mike. It was a possibility it was going to be dangerous, but, you know, we couldn't let that guy run loose. Nobody thought twice about it. Just. This is a job, we gotta protect people, and we gotta go get this guy. You know, we're always hopeful for the most peaceful outcome, but you have to be prepared to be the most violent person you can be. It's not who you are, but that's who you have to be to get the job done. Try to figure out where the boat was in relation, because they explained to us over the radio, but somebody explaining to you where something's at, you know, how you picture it and how it ends up being is a lot of times different. The right side of the residence, I noticed there was a floodlight on on that side, but it was it was still pitch black outside. So when we jump out of the Bearcat and we pull down the driveway and we were going to form a wedge, once we got around the side of the residence, we was going to form a wedge um, and move down to this John boat and check it. Mike was sitting right next to me, Cody, and um, just got out of the car, we got out of the truck, he hit me on the knee, just let me know he was there with me. Um, peeled out of the truck. Um, one team went right. I went left because they were short on that stack. And my group was going to go left. And somehow we ended up switched when we got out of the truck. And I was the last one, I, I was the last one to get out of the truck because of where I was sitting. We get out, Mike jumps out and goes ahead and takes off to the right. Well. For us, that's no big deal. It's no different than building entry. If somebody goes right and you just go left, no, no, no problem. So Mike goes right, Buddy goes with Mike, Kyle goes with Mike, we go left. Mike Doty was already taken off around the corner of the house. Now there was a house and there was the wood line. There was a wood line around the back of the house. 
over to my right. And I was on night, I had my night vision on. As our team, the team on the right, saw it around in the house, there's a large deck. Buddy and Mike and Kyle got to their corner before we did, and there was a porch on their side that you couldn't really see when we pulled up. So on the left side, there was a garage that was a lot longer. It took us longer to get to the corner than it did them. So they actually made it around the corner before we did. And I yelled at Mike while I was, Mike. And I pulled him back to me so we could go in together, you know, as a team. And um, there was a deck. I saw the house and then I saw a deck. There was a deck kind of over here to the left. And it looked like from the front, it looked like it was only this, about this high off the ground. It looked like one of those where somebody just builds up like a little deck on the back of their house mm -hmm. and it's like flat level with the ground. Well, I didn't, I thought that's what it was when we, and it's dark, you know, it's like two or three o'clock in the morning. And we go out there and I'm, I'm on the point. Mike's about a double arm's length back here. I can kind of see him out of my periphery as we're going. And then Kyle is somewhere behind us in the number three position. Um, buddy being the experienced team member that he is, um, pointed out for us to check the deck. And we go around the side of the house, and I didn't want to, I thought about jumping in the woods, but we, we were trying to go to this spot back by the pond, and if we got in the woods, we were going to sound like a herd of elephants because the, the leaves were dry. So we stayed kind of in between the house and the wood line, and as we came around the deck, we had... Um, I noticed that it was, the ground was dropping off and it was big enough where somebody could get under there. And as we were coming, I, I, had, my, I had my rifle out in front of me like here and I'm looking out here. I remember I took my hand off my rifle and told Mike, let's check under that deck. And I, and I did that. And when I pointed, he started shooting us. We haven't even gotten around the left side of the residence when just the god awfulest gunfire breaks out. Um, he hit Buddy and Mike instantly. Um, his, he was surprisingly very accurate, um, very fast with his weapon. Um, undoubtedly he has trained with that weapon. I heard the first shot go out and it wasn't a pause but it was just that trying to, where's it coming from? We hear gunfire, we take off running at that point in time and I'm thinking that that guy is at that boat shooting back towards the house where they're at. I, uh, it didn't, it was, it was weird because it didn't knock me down. You know, you always think like from the movies and stuff, you see people get shot and cut flips and all and it, and it didn't knock me down. I was kind of standing there for just a second. And then, then I thought that, you know, I don't need to be here. I need to be somewhere else. And I rolled myself into the, I went down, kind of rolled myself over into the wood line and figured out where he was. He used the military style tactic on us. Um, the tactic was a near ambush. Um, those who have been in the military, um, they know how hard that tactic is to defeat. Um, we were essentially in what's called a kill zone. We had no idea that, that he was underneath the porch prior to that. He was up next to a hot tub. The FLIR can't see through stuff. It just picks up surfaces. So. It can't see through windows, it can't see through wood, it can't see through walls, nothing like that. So there was no way it could have picked up where his location. It, you know, nothing, no technology that I'm aware of could have told us that before we went around that corner. And then there was that first burst of gunfire, and then a brief pause, and then there was a second burst of gunfire. And then I knew that something wasn't right because when you hear a first burst, you think, okay, you know, good guys are firing rounds, everybody's okay. And then when you hear the pause and then the second set of gunfire, you realize that it's a, it's a gunfight. I knew immediately what had happened. Uh, there was no doubt what had happened. Um, I never saw Mike, I didn't see Mike in that initial, in the initial blast where he shot us. Um, and I don't remember this, but Kyle told me that when he hit, when I got hit, that I took my rifle and I pointed him out, I turned my weapon light on and shined it on McCall. And he said that when, he, when I did that, he saw him and then he said, okay, there he is. And he started, Kyle started shooting. Um, Buddy Brown, 
saved my life. Um, he did. Um, he doesn't even realize he did it. And we talked about it afterwards. He's like, man, I didn't even know I did that. But when he went to the ground, he used his flashlight, and uh, he illuminated McCall. He lit McCall up with his flashlight. Um, and when he did that, it showed me where McCall was, and I was able to fire and hit him. And then I started returning fire also. Uh, when I was returning fire in all that stuff was going on, I kind of saw what I initially thought was a pile of clothes kind of over here, and it was, it was where Mike had gone down. While I'm looking towards the back, the gunfire erupts again off to my right, and we figure out there's nobody back at that pond. Everything's going on on the corner of the house. I can see muzzle flash, but I'm trying to figure out whose muzzle flash is it. Is he just taking pop shots, you know? And it was just as soon as you could just hear that first one, you heard the second, it was just such a deep sound. You just knew it wasn't one of our rifles. And I just knew it was bad. Because then here comes a third, and then here it comes more shots. Um, he got grabbed the corner, he dug down. Lincoln, uh, Ligon, me, and Judd peeled off in sequence, spread out, fanned out, and I just see flashes coming from both sides of the yard. At the time, I saw a muzzle flash. And uh, I can hear um, what I thought was a bullet fly past my head. Um, so I put my sights on the muzzle flash and I fired some more. And uh, my weapon, um, my rifle, it had a malfunction. It's called a double feed. Um, my rifle double fed on me. And I was doing what's called transition. I, when my rifle double fed, I dropped it and was going to my handgun and I was shot. So I shoot back at me and Kyle are shooting back at McCall. Kyle gets shot somewhere in that in the, the exchange. And it's it's all happening so quick. It seemed like it was in slow motion, but it was all happening real quick. So as soon as I turn the light on on my weapon, I get muzzle flash. Well, I engage the muzzle flash, and it was coming from the deck area. Um, I engage the muzzle flash. Everything goes silent. And so at um, 3.28 a.m., um, as I'm talking to uh, Fred Moore on the phone, uh, just hear a barrage of gunfire. And the next thing you hear is gunfire. And uh, we all looked at each other, and the sheriff goes, did you hear that? I can still today, can still see that look on his face. And he said, is that what I think it is? And I said, yes, sir. And I jumped out of the truck. When the shooting started, I remember hearing the gunshots while sitting in the back of the negotiator truck, which, and I was like, okay, we're done. We're going home. This is it. We're over. And then I kept hearing gunshots. But we really had no idea exactly where they were, um, me and, and the two canine handlers. And we're standing on the side of the, someone's house. And I don't know how long it was, um, all of a sudden you heard like a, 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 a valet of, I mean, it was just shots going, you know, firing, pow, 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 I mean, really, really loud. Joey just bolted out of the car. He was already running down the road. The sheriff and I get out of the car and we go down and, and we're standing there and behind the ambulance that was already staged there and I ran around the back of the truck and ran to the ambulance and I opened the back doors on the ambulance and told them to lay down. And I remember somebody opened in the back of the ambulance and they said, get down, he's coming this way. And they looked at me again, I said, lay down. And they laid down the back of the truck and I shut the doors back and I got in the front of the ambulance and started backing the ambulance up the road. I mean, it was kind of like firecrackers, you know, but it was closer, I mean, it was really close. It sounded like it was right there on top of us. Um, even though it was a little ways away from us, but it sounded like it was right there. Patrol guys were kind of scrambling. I remember it was kind of chaos there for a minute. And all of a sudden, everything just broke loose on the radio. Hi, right, guys, we got shot at. We're in the middle of the road. Buddy, tell us where you're at. We want to know where you're at. So if we get some buckle flies. <laughs> Eight or nine, go ahead. We just behind me at two. And I'll be there at the 30th hour. Suspect is at gunpoint. Suspect at gunpoint. 
It's not a natural thing to put yourself in a line of fire. Um, you know, and you see it on TV if you watch football when they when they say that a quarterback standing in the pocket and he's getting ready to get sacked, but yet he still throws the football and it makes a completion. You know, that's cute. Um, you know, when you stand in, in the pocket knowing you're about to get shot and still you fight back, you know. It's hard to even put in words. The, the yelling on the radio, we knew something wasn't right, but we didn't know exactly who it was and where they were at. I grabbed the Charlotte guy that was down there, threw him in the truck with me, and we took off trying to find where everybody was. And then I see legs. I remember seeing legs. And like when it's dark and you're running around and you've got a, a gun on your rifle or your light, you can see the, the, the lights make traces, you know, they trace on the ground. And I was laying on the ground and um, I remember seeing legs and I remember seeing the lights searching around everywhere and, and I was yelling at that point because I wanted them to know, you know, where I was. I was mad. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to know where I was because um, I had gotten cut myself kind of off in the woods. We didn't know where he was. I pushed up. I hit my light and I saw him. Um, I saw Dodie laying there. I start moving, I cut my light on. When I scan the deck, I can see the bad guy under the deck. I holler it out. At that point in time, uh, Lieutenant Clevenger and Grady Gonzalez go and they cover down him. I look to my left and we've got somebody down. I couldn't tell it was him. I could just tell it was one of ours from the uniform. And immediately I started using my weapon light looking and over to the right I picked up the suspect up underneath the house I yelled push man down I got to him and I'm scanning I can't find I'm just looking but I'm constantly trying to evaluate Mike Mike's not responding I roll him uh, life's gone you, know, you just see it in his eyes you just, you just know that he's, he's there but he's not um, Ligon's right there with me I holler at Grady, Grady comes, we pull Mike out of, he was almost in line with where uh, the bad guy was. And we pull him back and um, Grady goes back to assist with covering down on the bad guy. And um, I start checking Mike, you know, there's no holes in him or anything. He's unresponsive. I, I give him CPR, he starts breathing. I look, I notice blood on my hands from where I'd done a head tilt on him and um, realized that he'd been shot in the head. It's about my left, about my, about my 10, 10, 11 o'clock, while I step up over Doty to use my body as a shield and I punch out and I hit my light and I take the safety off and I realize that it's Buddy about 25 yards off. He's head down towards me, but he lifts his helmet up re-engage my safety. I said, bro, just stay there. I'll come back and get you. I swear I'll come back and get you. I tell Ligon, don't leave him, bro. Just keep working him. I'll be back. I hear Heath yelling. I got him under the porch. I picked up the suspect up underneath the house or up underneath the porch and he had uh, his hands in a surrender position. I get to the porch, guy's got his hands up, he's surrendering. Heath and I take up good vantage points. Uh, we had him covered. Getting on the radio, just trying to get some help down there for our guys. Um, you know, just the guy frozen time, man. He just, he didn't, he didn't want to die, I guess for whatever reason, he didn't want to die then. Did everything we told him to do. In that initial barrage of, of fire, 
I got, I didn't, I knew I got shot in the leg. I knew, I felt, there was no doubt what that was. But I also got struck in my helmet. Uh, the helmet stopped the rounds, and I got struck in the handguard of my rifle. I didn't, I didn't know about my rifle or my helmet initially. And then I got so weak that I couldn't stand, and so I ended up falling down. And uh, I can hear Buddy in the distance. Um, I can hear him yelling. He wasn't too far, but he had made his way to cover. Um, I heard the call on the radio that I never wanted to hear. Officers down. <coughs> we need medics. So immediately I jumped out of the barricade. From my safe area and started running towards where the gunfire was on the other side of the house. As I got to the corner of the house, um, I don't remember who it was, but someone grabbed me and said, Kyle's on the ground right here. We need you right here. I had a truck right there, so I hopped in it and followed the, the EMS truck down to the incident scene and um, uh, parked. There's a, a, a barn or a garage. I parked right in front of it and um, accessed the scene near the ambulance. Um, uh, and what I later found out it was between where the shooter was and, and the ambulance. We didn't have a real good idea on where the shooter was at that time. We knew he was pinned down. So I'm running down the driveway and I go off to the right of the residence. And as I'm going off to the right of the residence, I run past the Bearcat and I see uh, Lieutenant Ligon running by me with somebody draped over his shoulders. I think it was uh, Chris Rowe from Rock Hill City SWAT team helped me get Mike up. I got Mike in a fireman's carry and I took off with him to the ambulance that was around the front side of the residence that had been that was coming up in the driveway. Um, I parked the ambulance, threw it in park, jumped out and I ran over um, and as I was going in I saw some people pass and I just I caught a glimpse um, of those guys going by and I could tell somebody was hurt bad. At that point I didn't know who it was. First patient I encountered was Mike Doty. Uh, he was brought out and um, put on the stretcher, and um, I asked where he was hit, and uh, I'm not sure who answered me, but they said uh, head, and I heard hand, thinking we can deal with this, and. Um, I did a quick look and there was nothing wrong with Mike's hand. Checked further and, and noted that um, Mike was uh, in need of a trauma center and um, there was nothing that I could do for, for Mike at that time. So I drive my truck down to the driveway of where, uh, 1475 Param, I didn't know the address then, but I just knew that's where the firing came from. Um, and I get out and I, and I tell Trent to just stay in my hip pocket. Uh, we get out of, uh, we, we pull up the driveway and we get right behind the uh, ambulance. And we both get out at the same time, we run up to the ambulance and there's Cole Green in the back of the ambulance. I remember somebody snatched the back doors of the ambulance open. And the only person I remember seeing run by the back of the ambulance was Sheriff. And I remember somebody saying, are you okay? I don't remember who it was, but they looked in the back of the ambulance and said, are you okay? The Sheriff goes, are you okay? Are you hit? And he goes, and Cole said, no, I've, I've just got hypothermia. I can't move my legs. And then we both come around the edge of the ambulance. Um, Mike is being brought up on a stretcher, uh, an ambulance stretcher past me and um, I immediately recognized it as Mike and knew at first glance how critical Mike was just by looking at him. And it was, um, and it was Mike. And it was Mike on the stretcher and then the sheriff just, he yells and, and he yells and says, Mike, Mike. I shook his chest a little bit, uh, yelled, Mike, 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 uh, just, you know, I don't know why I did that. Maybe I thought I could wake him up or uh, I wanted to see how, you know, 
bad. Maybe he was. I don't know why. Uh, I was just reaching out to Mike, and uh, of course they they um, wheeled him on. It almost was slow motion because you don't think that that's the person you think it is, and then that's when I realized that wasn't good. And so the sheriff and I we run up towards the house, and I'm sitting at the cab of the ambulance, and when they roll that gurney up. It's coming right towards me. <clears throat> and I remember looking at that person trying to figure out who it was. And then it dawned on me it was Mike. Mike Schnell, Chuck Haynes, um, two of our SWAT medics are some of the finest human beings that you can ever hope to meet in your life. First person I came up to, um, laying on the ground was Kyle, myself, and um, uh, Arthur Filson from the city. I remember distinctly looking at, at Arthur, and um, Kyle was laying there, and his glasses were kind of turned on his face, and I took his glasses off his face, and I put them in my vest, and I, had, I was holding one hand, and I was kind of feeling on his chest trying to see, and Arthur was kind of giving a sternum rub, but he was giving a serious sternum rub, and it, you could tell Kyle was, he was kind of in shock, but he was really rubbing his chest hard, and um, I remember patting Arthur's hand and saying, hey, hey, and when he did, he turned around, and he hit me, he hit me in the head with his helmet, and I kind of dazed me just a little bit, and I kind of backed up, and as I was feeling down, I felt kind of wet, and as, just as I put my hand over top of his leg, Mike and, uh, Mike Chanel and Chuck Haynes came up. So I immediately ran to Kyle. <clears throat> who was screaming in pain, bleeding profusely from his gunshot wound. I thought I was gonna bleed to death. This is the way I was bleeding. I can just feel the blood spurting. Um, I thought I was done. I really did. Um, I didn't think there's any coming back for it because I knew that the medics weren't gonna come to me until he was secure. I mean, that's just, you know, this is how life works. I mean, that's how it works. I mean, you can't expose them to gunfire, you know, because you just can't. So uh, I was laying there, and the next thing I know, here come the medics. Um, it was dark, really hard to see things, doing a lot of work by feel. Um, doing a lot of work by muscle memory, really, because um, at that point, things were just so chaotic. Um, all of my training kicked in. They came um, without any regard to personal safety. Um, they didn't know if the suspect was still able to fire, but they didn't care. Um, they had no reservations about what they were doing whatsoever. Um, they came and they got to me and they saved my life. I was kind of overtaken by um, the smell of gunpowder, um, the smell of blood, um, just the, the um, um, organized chaos that was, was going on. Everybody knew that there were things that had to be done, but it was, it was cold, it was dark, um, people were hurt, our friends were hurt, and um, we needed to, to do a lot of things in a short amount of time. And so initially I thought it was Judd Baird, and then uh, I heard people yelling Kyle's name, and so I knew it was Kyle, and I remember just looking at him, just, you know, he had lost all the color in his face, so he looked really pale, and I knew it, it wasn't good for him. We were having a problem with getting the tourniquet high enough above the wound to, to be effective because of the, the clothing. Um, fearing that, that we had to do something in the meantime or knowing we had to do something in the meantime and fearing the worst, uh, I went ahead and, and I used my finger to, to go into his wound and, and um, find a vessel that was bleeding and um, was able to kind of pin that against his femur. So they actually had some stuffed gauze in my leg and actually hold pressure and they had to have their hand inside my leg to get the bleeding to stop. Um, and those men 
are the only reason why I'm here. We knew who, he was bad. We had him stabilized as much as we could. The next thing we were fighting with Kyle was hypothermia and the and the the all the issues that cold weather brings with a traumatic injury. I put my rifle on safe and laid my head down and passed out for just a minute. Um, I don't know how long, but they rolled me over. When they rolled me over, I came to, took my gear out of Chris Rowe from the city was there. Uh, they took my took all my vest and everything off of me uh, and started to carry me out. Uh, Carlos Colbert with the city. Carlos is big, strong. I mean, he's a big, very strong guy. And uh, they were messing around with how they were going to pick me up, you know, because I'm, I'm big. And Carlos just came in and scooped me under my arms. And I remember him saying, um, I remember him saying, I got you, buddy. I got you, buddy. And picked me up. And, and he drug me along. He drug me by himself back behind the Bearcat and got me back there. He told me afterwards that he needs to work his legs more because it was hard for him to carry, you know, to carry me. And I remember seeing a bear cat in front of me and, um, and they were, they were dragging Buddy Brown um, out, out, out towards the bear cat. And I remember I just ran across. Kyle was kind of in and out. We kept talking to him, trying to keep him calm at the same time um, from where we were at you turned and looked immediately to your left, we could see under the deck area and you could see something sticking down. We found out later it was a jacuzzi, but you could see that, but you couldn't tell where anybody was at. So they, the guys from the city actually pulled the MRAP in between us and the deck. Saying to Buddy, you know, saying, Sarge, it's gonna be all right, you're gonna be good. And I remember them putting, putting a tourniquet on him, like real, real high up on his thigh um, and trying to get that. And then um, I look over towards the, the Bearcat and here they come. They they're pulling Buddy out of the out of the woods. And I can see Buddy. It's his his whole pants. It's his front area of his pants are just covered in, in red and in, in blood. And the one thing that comes out of his mouth that I'll never forget. He didn't care about himself, but all he said was, "How's Mike? How's Mike?" And. Uh, so I went to Buddy Brown, and um, Buddy was hitting his thigh also. Um, I used the gunshot wound to actually open it up, open, open Buddy's pants up so I could get to the wound. And I was fully expecting a, a very traumatic and obvious uh, wound just like I saw with Kyle. And as I was pulling the pants back, I was almost dreading what, what I was about to see. I mean, you know, it was, you know, I've, I've just seen two of my friends who were gravely injured. Now, now what? There was a lot of blood, but it was all bleeding into his abdomen, his thigh. Um, and that, that, for a medic, we can't do a whole lot with that. He needs a trauma surgeon. Right, we're going to need two, two helicopters. Two helicopters reference medical. That's affirmative, sir. We have two helicopters going to that same landing zone, South Parham, Charlotte Highway. Two birds in the air. And then here comes Walter Beck in the truck. Uh, I didn't know who had been shot. I didn't know how bad anybody was. Um, I pulled in. Behind the uh, behind one of the vehicles, I, I don't know if it was the MRAP or the Bearcat, in the yard of this really nice house on Parham Road. And you know the guys were like, "Turn around, turn around, back up, turn around, back up. We're gonna put him in your truck." I remember just at one point they said, "Okay, it's time to move. Let's get him up and move him." So a couple of us picked Kyle up, and went towards the truck with him. We loaded up Sergeant Brown, and then they dragged um, Kyle Cummings out from behind the Bearcat somewhere and, and put him on, on the back of the, in the back of the bed of the pickup truck. And I didn't know Buddy had been shot. I just knew somebody else had been shot over there. And I remember turning around distinctly seeing Buddy and Buddy was kind of walking on his own. Like they were helping him, but he was, you know, he's so big to try to find enough people to pick him up and carry him to the truck was, you know, so he was, he was kind of walking on his own and he got up in the truck and um, 
got him in the back, and then they took off. And he tore out of there with him in the back of his pickup truck. It, was, it reminded me, looking back, or kind of reminded me of a Vietnam movie where you see just, you know, just this quick um, load and go kind of thing, not, not knowing how critical Buddy was, not, not, not knowing how critical uh, Kyle was. Two injured, 618 has two injured en route to the landing zone at Aram and Charlotte Highway. 10-4, we have two helicopters heading that way. You know, I saw the medics were already there, and somebody yelled out, we got contact with a suspect, need more guns on the suspect. The rifle was laying in front of him, and he had his hands in a surrender position. And so, immediately, that was my job. When I pushed up to Heath, uh, Heath had him. Heath was holding the corner, I believe, under the porch. Heath had a good point on him. I hit my torch off angle and moved diagonal to get away from Heath because I didn't want to backlight him. And if he was going to turn, I wanted to follow my light, not know where Heath was. So Heath, I mean, Heath had him. I held cover on him while other people. We called. I got on the radio and, and informed them that I, I had him at gunpoint. That he was complying with verbal commands. I turn around and I see the suspect laid up underneath the porch. And from where I'm laying at, I can basically see the back of his head, the back of his shoulders, and probably part of his back. And so I get down in a prone position and I basically just hold my rifle right there on the back of his head. So if I have to take the shot, I know that it's gonna be an effective shot. I just remember holding him there and telling everybody he does, you know, talking about the suspect, said he doesn't move till our guys get out. Them first, them first. I remember laying there and I had that crosshair on the back of the suspect's head and I started to lose feeling in my trigger finger. And so, you know, I start to move my finger a little bit to see how much feeling I have and I start to realize that I can't even feel the trigger anymore. And so I start to get concerned that maybe if I have to take the shot, I won't be able to do it because my fingers are numb. Rock Hill PD SWAT guys had shown up and filled in. They were on scene and when the shooting started had driven their APC down to the yard and they had gotten out to assist and, and they were filtering in around the around the porch while I had this guy at gunpoint. Carlos and Grayson and Roe and all those guys from the city, man, they showed up. Them rock stars, man. They they came in. You know, they they had the same look on their face. I was updating them that the the gun was in front of him, but there was the layout. Him being up next to that hot tub that was sunk into that uh, porch, there was no way that he could move and get out without coming over the rifle. And we're trying to call him out from underneath the porch because we don't want to crawl in there and get them and get in a gunfight in an enclosed space because you're not going to be able to maneuver. A lot of bad things can happen. James Grayson came around, man. We had plenty of guys there. I just remember Grayson was getting ready to go under there and get him to secure him. And I just said, no. Still had a pack on and I just, I, yeah, the guy had already ambushed us twice. I was worried maybe he had a pack rigged, maybe had his pack rigged, something trying to learn us in. Um, we were already in a kind of a, a really dangerous spot, so I just like, you know, he doesn't move till he loses the pack. And the guy was like, I can't, I said, and I just remember just yelling at him, said, you lose the pack, that's the only way you're coming out of there. I was concerned that he would use it as some kind of ruse or, or something and, and go for the gun or pick the gun back up and, and start shooting again. I mean, I could tell he was hit, and um, I just, I was so focused on him that I remember just watching the blood drops come off his finger. I just just through the just through my rifle i just i just i knew that no matter what was going to happen nobody else was going to get hurt grayson would rocky o swat come up and so while i'm holding cover on this guy uh, i tell him like look we need somebody to crawl up in there and grab the rifle to like extend out get low the guy was kind of propped up and so I had a shot, I had a clear shot if he could go in there and stay low and extend his arm out and grab that rifle and pull it out of there. So that's what he did. 
He got up in there, pulled the rifle out. And then we started giving him commands to come out, which initially he tried to say that he couldn't, and then he he did. So as the suspects, you know, starting to crawl out, I realized that all the county guys have their M4s, and it's difficult to try to apprehend somebody or put them into handcuffs when you have a rifle strapped over your chest. But I was looking around and I saw that a couple of the Rock Hill PD SWAT guys that were running pistols only. So I had said, uh, you and you put hands on them because they had pistols and they were able to holster their weapon and, and get hands on and get them in custody. Um, and I went back around and I stopped and talked to Captain Neely and then one of the gentlemen from SLED was there, one of the investigators from SLED and um, he said, we need to get everybody from York County, we need to move them, you know, out of here. And uh, I told everybody that was county, uh, take, just get out of his, get up towards the driveway and get, get, get away from him. Um, that was um, a call I made to make sure that uh, our guys being so emotional didn't um, didn't act on that emotion. And I distinctly turned around and some of the SWAT guys were like picking up equipment. But that's, you know, that's what they train. And after after they train, you know, they go back and they pick equipment up. Well, that's, they were just doing as they were trained. They were picking stuff up. And I was like, hey guys, don't pick anything up. You know, you can't pick stuff up. Because I went back to detective mode. This is a crime scene. You know, you can't pick stuff up started towards the landing zone to meet the incoming helicopters. They were talking about helicopters and stuff, and I knew that the, the closest landing zone was New Home AME Church at Parham and Charlotte Highway. We got in the back of the truck and laid down on top of Kyle and Buddy, trying to give them as much heat as we, we could. Uh, we got to the church. Uh, the ambulance was there with uh, Mike Doty waiting on their helicopter. Um, Buddy was uh, complaining of a lot of injuries, one being he, he felt like he was going to throw up and, and dizziness, stuff like that. Uh, I chalked that up to possibly blood loss, things like that. Right there at the truck while waiting on the second ambulance. And it, it wasn't long, it was seconds and suddenly we had ambulances. We had, we had the people, we had a helicopter, we had a, a Bethel Fire Department engine there. But he's sitting on the tailgate of the truck. Uh, and I remember him being nauseous and wanting to throw up. And I couldn't understand. <laughs> and you got shot in the leg, why are, you, why are you sick to your stomach? You know, that's just weird to me. And turns out later on, I know why, it's because he had a concussion. And then one of the, one of the people working on me in the ambulance was one of the, he was moonlighting because he's one of the assistant coroners, Butch Lindsay. So I'm laying in there and they're putting, a, they're putting an IV in me and Butch Lindsay looks at me and I was like, no Butch, no, not today. And he laughed and we, we still laugh about that. And then we had Kyle that was um, somewhat stable, but still needed a trauma surgeon. Uh, we made the decision um, fairly quickly um, once the uh, first incoming EMS unit arrived that uh, the helicopter was too far away for Kyle. We needed to get him on. So the decision was made to fly Mike Doty, to fly Buddy Brown, and to go by ground with Kyle. Uh, Chuck and I swapped off care for Buddy and Kyle and I stayed with Buddy on scene and Chuck rode with uh, Kyle due to his higher level of, of training and so forth. So we were in the ambulance for a few minutes. I remember they cut all my clothes. I made, uh, I made Walter take my boots because I didn't want my boots. I didn't want him to cut my boots. I had these really nice boots I'd bought and I didn't want him to cut them up. So I asked him to un unlace them and take them and put them in his truck and he did. And I remember him saying, just don't let him cut my shoes. Don't let him cut my shoes. I said, buddy, we ain't cutting your shoes. I'm, I'm gonna take them off. And uh, he didn't want to lose those boots. They cut the rest of my clothes all to pieces. He was all upset about his, you know, everybody had on their Under Armour cold gear and stuff. It's like, 
man, I, that, that cold gear's expensive. I was like, well, it's got a bullet hole in it. It ain't no good now anyway. So then they flew me to uh, CMC. And, you know, I was a helicopter air crewman in the Marine Corps. So I've flown in helicopters before, but never like that. I, I was awake for most of the most of the ride to the hospital. Um, yeah, I believe Butch Lindsey with P my EMS, um, he was driving me. Remember that, and uh, know that. I remember looking out of the ambulance when I was on my way up there, and I saw how Charlotte PD had the on ramps blocked, and they were blocking traffic for us. One thing that was was particularly clear was um, Char Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department and probably a lot of others was escorting us up the interstate and through red lights and we got there pretty quickly. Actually we beat the aircraft there. And then getting to the hospital, um, when I got there I wasn't there long before they took me back into surgery. Um, they took me back and I woke up a couple hours later. Before Kyle uh, went to surgery, uh, we figured out that we weren't going to be able to get her there in time. And so um, Kyle gave me his wedding ring in order to give to her. And um, when he handed it to me, um, not only was I, I was already a bloody mess anyway, but his ring was was um, bloody, and and um, so I left and went and found a sink and and I washed his ring uh, before um, I gave it to his wife. Brought me in and and I got real confused when I first got there because um, Chris Kinsey and Tim Carroll were there. And I didn't know that they had taken Randy to CMC. I just knew that they had taken Randy to Piedmont. I didn't know the extent of Randy's injuries, and I didn't know that they had taken him to CMC. So when I flew in in the helicopter, and Chris and Tim were already there, I was a little confused as to how you know that had happened. And, and I'm supposed to be going into surgery. Then I hear other talk amongst the officers outside behind the curtains they don't see me and they're sitting there talking and I hear them talking about yeah this guy's done shot multiple ones they got the place they fixing to shut the place down and I asked my wife I said what's going on I said you find out what's going on then that's when I found out that Kyle's been shot Mike doty has been shot and Buddy Brown's been shot and um, it was funny because one thing I, I really remember is out there on the scene and getting loaded in the ambulance and getting driven, I was never afraid. I was never scared out there. And when I got to the hospital, they were rolling me back, when they were rolling me back to do the scans, I saw myself in a window as I was going by. I was laying on my side because if I laid on my side, it didn't hurt. It hurt really bad to lay on my back, but if I laid on my side, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't as bad. And I saw myself in a, in a mirror, in a window as I went by and that was, um, I knew I was hurt bad then. I knew that that was, that it wasn't good. And so, uh, we, you know, McCall is finally loaded, uh, in the ambulance and, and, um, my last image that night of him is him sitting up in the ambulance in the driveway, um, uh, propped up he intended to with a smirk on his face. Um, it's my last image of him. Uh, and I think they shortly shut the doors and, and um, had a conversation with Captain Williams about next steps and, and uh, with, with Trent. And so we'd go back out in front of the house and I said, I had to tell the sheriff, we, we, gotta, we gotta figure out what we're gonna say you know, to the media. And I knew that was the, the last thing he wanted to talk about that night. Some point in time, close after that time, I was walking further down the driveway to where my truck was and uh, I just sort of turned around and there's Chief Chris Watts with the Rock Hill Police Department. And he says, you okay? And um, I, it was like, um, 
a tidal wave just hit me, the enormity of it, and that was the first um, break of chaos. And I bent over, kind of put my hands on my knees, and, and, I, and I started to cry, and I said, I was until you, in, until you showed up, or I was until you just asked me that, and, and, and he was uh, extremely supportive uh, of me and, and the situation and, and the gravity of it, and, and I uh, got in my truck and I headed back here to the office. Um, I had I had Randy's gear uh, that he had. Uh, it was given to me at the hospital, um, and uh, we met. I met the team, SWAT team, back here at, at, at uh, in the detention pro star room, and I had a just a short spiel with them. Uh, we prayed. And um, I told them what I knew at the time, the information that I was given at the time, and uh, tried to offer some words of encouragement. And it was, you know, it was at that point in time in my tenure that I realized um, the enormity of this job. How real it is, and how you worry and take on the um, pain of your folks, and you reach down deeper than you thought you ever could to uh, be strong for them because that's what, that's what they need. That's what you think they need. Um, it was then that that, that sense of, of uh, <clears throat> responsibility hit you or hit me.